Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning. I'm sorry to, to, to speak in English. Uh, I understand Italian and I read Italian, but I was never uh, educated properly to, to, to speak it uh, uh, as, um, as uh, the language deserves. Um, I'd like uh, first to thank the organizers and to praise uh, Rowers for this initiative, which is uh, quite um, unique in Europe. But I'd like first just to say two words, if you allow me, because that's, uh, I think that's the third time I am in this room um, and uh, for the last 30 years. And uh, I think I was twice with, uh, with two Italian ministers and as a minister, once as a president of uh, uh, the Foundation of Science and Technology, my own country. But that's the first time uh, I am as, uh, uh, as myself. Um, and uh, as myself only. I was also as myself in the other. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and that's quite quite unique. So I think I'm really looking at uh, at the room at, a, at a, with a different scale. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, President of uh, TNR. Uh, the, the initiative by Rose to 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 encourage the discussion on science policy by scientists, and I will uh, uh, speak at the end a little bit about it. It's, it's very unique. I have been following closely in the United States and across European countries the initiative by, the organized initiative by scientists and scientific organizations uh, uh, to contribute to the evolution of science policy. And um, uh, there is an enormous deficit in that area, enormous deficit in that area. Of course, there are uh, uh, various initiatives at disciplinary level, at uh, uh, scientific associations and science and learning societies do it. But you are probably now uh, one of the few, if not the only one, that is doing it at, uh, at the Italian level, but open to the problems outside Italy. And with the, 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 the idea that, uh, and you, I think you are right, that uh, uh, although each uh, situation is specific, of course, there are many problems that have to be addressed at a wider scale. Well, without further uh, discussion, I will just uh, uh, go on. Uh, and, and I'll try to, to, to do it as quickly as, as possible and as language allows. I understand there will be questions and, uh, uh, and anyhow I will be here the whole day and uh, I will uh, be open for, for discussion. Okay, uh, let, me, let me start by, by in, a, in a strange way. Uh, when I, uh, for many years I, I taught physics and I used to, 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 to describe to my students that uh, optics has been uh, more or less the same, as far as we know, uh, for many, many years, the laws of optics. And um, that is, uh, for physicists, that's uh, 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 the, the basis of uh, the, the light goes through the path that uh, corresponds to minimum time. And in fact, we have recognized that that is uh, 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 special application of the general rule of uh, minimal action uh, because of the characteristics of uh, uh, massless uh, um, uh, photons. Uh, and, and that has been discussed for many, many years. But the reason I, was, uh, I wanted to impress my students was to tell them, and I was uh, teaching this in Lisbon, was to impress them that at least since the 16th century, the laws of optics have been the same. This is a, a church in the center of Lisbon where one of the first uh, very important programs that resulted in the expulsion and the killing of thousands of Jews took place. It was in 1506 and it started by the reflection of light because the light by the sun entered the church unhappily, and uh, there was a reflection on the altar, and uh, the crowd 
shouted that there was a miracle. And someone there, unfortunately, his parents had been Jews, said, well, it's the light. And on that night, uh, almost 5,000 5, people died and were murdered. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, this story uh, is for me forever connected with optics. And that's the question of science. It is deeply connected with society. And without that deep connection, I don't think science policy is possible because it requires a scientific, a social and political constituency that goes much beyond the scientists, their organizations, the governments, the political parties, etc. Without a very strong social constituency, you cannot have science. That is what I have learned in my life. Now, let me just go quickly to the situation at world level. The situation is very different at world level to what we see around uh, in our countries. Very different. Over the, last, uh, over the last decade, the number of students in higher education, and that's probably the single driving force for science at world level, increased almost 80% from 100 million to 180 million in one decade. It had never happened before. So higher education had become a kind of social aspiration for middle classes all around the world, mainly in Asia, but also in Africa, in Latin America, etc. And it is a driving force for education in general and that driving force is creating universities, giving jobs to people who are also researchers, and in fact, attracting funding for the production of knowledge, the academic production of knowledge. But this is also true concerning research, and we can see that in research. Uh, George Cirilli Dalin knows much more about these statistics, but I really couldn't find reliable statistics for I could find for students, but not for research at world level. Uh, this short period is the only one I think it's more or less documented at world level. But it shows that the, 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 there was an enormous, and, 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 and I think all the indications show there is an enormous increase of public and private money put into research at world level. And the number of, of publications and the number of people doing research. My conclusion is easy, is, is simply that, uh, and I don't think it's very dangerous to say, that unless war stops it all, and that's possible, unless war stops it all, in 20 or 30 years' time, science will be totally different just because you will have twice the number of researchers or three times the number of researchers you have today. And that means that certainly that the ideas will have changed. That so many people and so many young people from, from parts of the world who have never had access to education, well, certainly science, all areas of science will change. So mass higher education is probably the single driver at world level that is creating new social constituencies for science and education. It is uh, an irrepressible uh, uh, social response to globalization. It's probably the most important social response to globalization. It is shaping political evolution, and we have seen that it's shaping revolution in many parts of the world. You, you have seen in the, in, in, the, in the southern border of the Mediterranean that all these revolutions have been triggered by the expansion of the higher education system. And of course, they all these revolutions fail. Uh, 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 because it crystallizes aspirations of social mobility and promises of social progress that will remain largely unfulfilled, at least for that generation in, in many parts of the world. But not in all parts of the world. Certainly the situation in Tunisia or Algeria or uh, uh, Libya or Egypt is very different from the situation 
in, in, uh, in Malaysia or the situation in China. I'll not go very, very deeply into the, these points. What are the consequences of it uh, that, that you can foresee at, um, at the gender setting? There is a very old story about a discussion in the sociology of science about the gender setting in science. Uh, uh, who sets the agenda? How uh, scientific agendas are set? Uh, what is the combination between the, the previous agenda, the scientific results, the, the, the culture and the evolution of uh, uh, cultural values and aspirations in society? Um, well, that has been um, discussed uh, um, during these last years in different uh, uh, forms, and, and th that is obviously a very, very rough this, uh, uh, proposal. And, and my, my, my uh, suggestion is the following from the available data in studies is that the, 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 the fact that uh, um, the constituency for science at world level are changing and expanding means that uh, public risks will come top of the, the, the setting of the scientific agendas because, uh, of course, if millions of people are, are going into the game and paying for, for a new science, they will not accept that uh, either dictatorships or democracies will ignore disease, will ignore uh, uh, pandemia, will ignore uh, natural disasters. Those things will have to be part of, of the, the, the response, first of all. And, um, and things like environmental risks, water, food, energy are now top of the agenda in many, many parts of the world, precisely in the parts of the world where the expansion is faster uh, now. Data-intensive science is becoming certainly one of the uh, most uh, resilient characteristics of, uh, of, uh, of scientific agendas. But that's not the ideas. Those are the framework for, for doing research. But in fact, uh, 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 the developing world is learning that data-intensive science uh, uh, could be seen a few years ago as an easy way of, as they used to say, jumping uh, through the next steps. But in fact, it is not, because the, the, those who really produce and know how to produce the data are always on the lead. It's not the fact that you have access to genomic information in Pakistan or India or South Africa that you are as good in producing new knowledge out of it as a small lab in Sweden that has produced the data and characterized the data and knows what is rubbish in that data and what is really reliable in the data. Very frankly, that is now common knowledge uh, uh, at world level. But politically, it's a critical issue. And it's a critical issue for the experimental sciences. You cannot jump over the hard work of doing observation yourself, on learning how to do it, and doing experimental science yourself. OK, let me uh, uh, continue and go uh, now to uh, some of, of the, then I will go to the statistics. But before going to the statistics, I would like very much, because I understand that that is a question that has been around and uh, being discussed very much in Italy, not only in Italy, but in other countries. Uh, but certainly in Italy, in Italy it has uh, 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 been colored with, with a very strong uh, emotional passion that is uh, in direct proportion with the violence of, of the applications of, of many of the principles that uh, have, been, uh, uh, have been under discussion in many parts of the world. And that is the question of how scientific systems are now reacting or have been reacting over the last 20 years to anxiety and to what uh, John Zyman, the late John Zyman, a uh, friend of some of us, uh, um, described 
uh, in a pioneer text uh, at the beginning of then publishing book at the beginning of the 90s, that, that's 20 years ago. He, 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 he explained to us that uh, the difficulties he was having in his own department or uh, uh, that colleagues were experiencing in, with words like uh, accountability, uh, objective uh, uh, evaluation, um, uh, independent, etc., uh, etc., uh, etc. Et These type of things were not just something that would disappear, were something that was coming as a kind of uh, uh, very strong and very invasive disease that would stay with us for many, many years. So in the, this, and they tried to understand the reasons for it. And they said, well, in countries like the UK, the reason for it is simple. Since the Second World War, we have expanded at 5 10% a year. And uh, we were ex society was extremely generous because we wanted everyone to have an opportunity in the, and, and, and we wanted to, to grasp these opportunities and we had that possibility. And then it came to a halt. Well, not decreasing, no, no, but, but at least it, it became stable. The resources became stable, the number of people that we have tried to produce, tried to educate, were finally in, in, in big numbers. And, um, and we were not brave enough to continue, uh, to continue doing what we, we were supposed to do. And uh, the reaction to it was a very rational reaction. It was to say, well, we have to control every penny. Uh, that's, uh, that's not good. You are spending, you are not spending, uh, your, your, let's see the productivity. And, and, and extraordinary things like uh, uh, bibliometric automatic factors, so that's something that could be any bureaucrat can calculate, etc., it started being used. Well, you know all about it. You know the San Francisco Declaration that uh, some of us have signed. Uh, uh, you, you know the difficulty of, of doing it uh, um, in juries, in universities. Uh, you know that you can do it, yes, you can do it, but uh, you must be at least as old as myself and you must, uh, 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 in order to protect the young people uh, from it. I remember that uh, in a discussion about this, these questions with very distinguished colleagues from um, both sides of the Atlantic very recently, I remember, and uh, for me that's a, a key point that I always remember, uh, um, is a, a, a colleague, I, I must conceal the name, sorry, uh, who, 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 because he has in high, is now in higher functions, uh, a professor at MIT who, who told European colleagues, well, I'm sorry, uh, I don't understand what you are talking about. When we have to select a new professor, well, we, we, we do a call for applications, we receive applications, we ask the candidates to, uh, uh, to indicate which few articles or books, etc., they consider the most relevant pieces, and we just read them. We just read them. Okay? We are not counting anything and nor asking anyone else. Okay? And, and if we are not competent to, to read them, then we shouldn't be there. <laughs> Very simple. Um, okay, that's, I think that's the lesson we must always think about. Um, let's, uh, 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 with due uh, uh, praise to John Zyman, for those who are interested in the other part of the scientific equation, and that is the relation with science, with the social constituency that has to support science, I would recommend you, uh, uh, Joe and Solomon, both these two persons uh, 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 died, and that was a posthumous book that uh, has been recently published, uh, uh, a book by John Solomon, probably one of the most interesting uh, uh, research ever done 
on the, the, the use of science by the people. That is based upon interviews on all persons of one village in, uh, in, in, in the UK over a certain number of years. Okay, let's go to, to, to statistics now, to the real data. Government budgets are about political decisions. So government budgets are not about money. Government budgets are an expression of political decision. And political decision is a measure of social and political constituency. Um, in the year 2000, I was there, in March 2000, um, we have collectively approved in Lisbon the so-called Lisbon strategy. We would become collectively the most advanced uh, knowledge-based society in the world, wasn't it? Well, let's look at the statistics. I don't read uh, this in the statistics. In the statistics, I read that there was a decision taken in the year 2000 in Washington where the United States decided that they were too close to Europe concerning the appropriation of uh, public money and uh, the taxes paid by taxpayers, and so that a larger sum, fraction of public money had to be invested in science. That's what was the statistics tell us. And the gap on public money, which means public decision by democracies on the investment of public money has been much ex more expanded in the United States than in Europe as a whole. And of course, Japan never changed its course and it is extraordinary the continuity of the public decision and you recall all the drama and changes in government, etc., in Japan all over that period. Okay, that's my first data. My second piece of data is to go deep into inside the European Union and try to understand this graph. Okay, now what happened in each European country. I, again, I'm speaking about political decision. I'm speaking about government budgets. I'm not speaking about the combination of industry, etc., etc. Just what a, a budget parliament and government decide. Left hand side, current prices. Um, uh, right hand side, uh, constant prices. Uh, that is uh, purchasing parity, corrected, etc., etc. Um, what happened? Well, what happened was quite clear. First, Germany won very, very clearly. So if there is something that happened in Europe, is that Germany took very seriously the decision taken in the year 2000 and decided to use every opportunity to pump public money into research and to create greater capacities for research. France had very difficult times, including an extraordinary dip uh, in a certain period uh, when there was economic difficulties, the political will was unable to produce countercyclical uh, 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 policies. The United Kingdom reacted as usual. So when GDP went up, it increased, and then it went a little bit down. But the UK is very different from all the other countries because the installed capacity in the UK is immense, probably one of the most important in the world. And the, the probably the most interesting story here is the story of Spain and Italy. Because uh, 
Spain was in a different league at the beginning of the decade. And Spain invested as much as it could to reach the level of Italy, and in fact, it succeeded. And now, at the global level, it is at the level of uh, Italy in terms of, I insist, of the public money that is invested in research. This is not pr uh, a proportion of GDP. Those are dollars. Okay, that's money. That's uh, employment. That's equipment. That's buildings. Uh, that's uh, libraries. That's everything. OK, if you just translate that now and try to look at the consequence of the public policy into the general picture, including industry, and mainly industry, you'll see that uh, 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 public money has, as the Americans have told us for the last 30 years, uh, uh, without uh, listeners from this side of the Atlantic, is that the way to, to translate uh, public money, uh, public decision making on priority on research into research in the private sector is to continuously invest public money into research. Well, and in fact, you will see exactly, for instance, in Germany, the same trend. The investment of public money after a certain number of years increased private money uh, being spent in research in Germany. OK. I will not go into, into all that. But I would just to like to, 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 to you to see that the number of researchers, the number of researchers, I'll try to find, yes, that's the total number of researchers. Not, not divided by anything, just, just numbers, full-time equivalent, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. This, this number, it's, it's been increasing almost everywhere. Uh, so during the last decade, those who really did it and who really uh, uh, tried to translate into action the decisions of the Lisbon summit in 2000, were families and youths themselves. Yes, they tried to study scientists and to go into those careers. And, uh, and even if the situation was not bright and they didn't know if there were employment or not, yes, they took the risk much more than government and parliaments. Individually and at societal level, the basis is there. It's extraordinary how uh, 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 a political movement of hope in the future of Europe had really positive consequences in the fact that the workforce in general, part of those researchers, when you see, when you see a rise, that means that a large fraction are very young people because they were not there, so they are very young. It's certainly not a movement of old people come coming to work in Europe. It's just youth entering the scientific professions in all, in all areas. Except one country that is now being affected very, very deeply, and that is Spain, after the crisis. You'll see it's the only country, and I've checked all of them, it's the only country where the actual numbers have been declining uh, because of immigration of scientists and because of many people in, uh, 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 unemployed. But in all the others, until at least the last data, that's 2012, the situation is degrading, it's being degraded in many countries, and probably others will also go down. Uh, the situation is there is an enormous reservoir now. Let me translate this now negatively. It's one of the most uh, interesting capitals of Europe, capital in terms of asset, but it's also an enormous vulnerability. If someone else is rich enough and has the, the, the institutional capacities, you just look at that and say, well, uh, you don't deserve that. 
sorry. You don't deserve these people because you are not doing what you should with the, the, the money their parents and their families pay in taxes to respond to, 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 their, to their perspectives in life. So the best thing to do is to take these people out from your countries and to ask them to come to work with us. To Australia, to New Zealand, to China, to the United States, whatever. I think that's the situation we are in now. And all these people are just rubbish. They are not doing anything. They are lazy people. Should we have um, a very important, uh, uh, m m a real machinery of inspectors in, in labs and universities, uh, probably appointed by, by some external uh, um, non-professional committees because they are very lazy? Apparently not. I mean, uh, never scientific publications have been in such a, a vast expansion. And, and as you see, the expansion is even faster than the number of people, so productivity is, 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 is bigger. Almost everywhere, almost everywhere. So the origin of this uh, uh, complex and almost uh, strange uh, uh, anxiety that is driven in uh, political parties across the spectrum in many governments, etc., it's a question of anxiety. It has no real basis. And, and it's not a response to the problem. Because the problem is, at the bottom, is the real transfer of an idea into a political priority. And the political priority can be measured only in one way, in the approval of a budget. Uh, I can tell you uh, for the experience of having been probably the, the Minister of Science longer in government ever, uh, prior, political priority to science has, at the end of the day, there is one key point. You get the budget or you don't get the budget. That's it. Because that is the real measure of it all. And it will depend on an enormous variety of factors. It will depend on the willingness of your prime minister. It will depend on the feeling the political parties have of the reaction of the population at large. It will have uh, uh, on the feeling if the scientists are really connected with society at large and with the uh, millions of families. It's not the scientists themselves as voters and nor the families, of course. And it's not the industrialists. It, and it's not uh, the innovation. No, it's nothing like that. Is, is this going to affect really the vote or not? Is it part of the idea of the future of the society that is so strong that we cannot afford, afford politically, to be accused of not giving enough priority to that? Or uh, is it something that we can just ignore or do more or less what we can, but not much. Because we have also other priorities. And it's normal that there are many demands from other sources for that in, in society. That's the key point that we have to address, in my view. So the real question seems to me, and I will now go uh, uh, one step further. How, how long, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, one minute, two minutes, three minutes? You are being very generous, I understand. Is that right? That's the multiplication of the minutes. Is it? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. OK. Um, fine. <laughs> well, let's see how I can do it. It's, um, uh, now, now it becomes a difficult problem. How to, 
to, to squeeze what I have to say in three minutes. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, Let me just, uh, 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 I need five minutes, sorry. I need five minutes. Oh, okay, because I would like to, to, to not to spend much time on, on statistics, but I would like at least to show one thing. Uh, this is, well, that's, that's not a very, very interesting graph, but it shows you, uh, but it is graphically uh, interesting because uh, the, the dimensions have, have uh, have, have to do with the, with the dimension of uh, the real dimension of, of, uh, of the systems. So the United States is rather big. It's not population, it's the money that is put into research. So it, it's the dimension of the scientific systems and how it is, uh, uh, it is very interesting to look at this uh, dynamically uh, over time. Uh, but um, uh, that I have not the time. But in red are countries of, of, um, of, um, of, the European, of the European Union. And, and the, what I would like to impress you is that the European Union is not uh, very united. I mean, it's, um, it's, uh, it's not a union. Um, if you look objectively to, to, to the situation of science in Europe, uh, you will see that from all points of view, well, there is a, um, a narrative, as uh, uh, literary people will tell us, there is a narrative that is going on in Brussels uh, and that, is, uh, that, that has some influence over 5% uh, of, of, or so of, uh, of the budget for research. But the reality is that the problems we have to face, we have to face our own, in our own countries. That's a problem that has to be, it's a question of national policies. And I think we should never be uh, as stupid as to believe that our questions are to be solved in a non-federal state, as we have in Europe, are to be solved by the others. Uh, it's something that is between us and our society, uh, scientists and the people, and that's it. Okay, there is an international dimension in it. And what is the international dimension? First, you see that the divergence is, is enormous. Uh, the situation in, uh, in uh, Finland or the situation in, uh, in the Czech Republic or the situation in Italy or the situation in Germany is very, very diverse. The priorities are very diverse. The, the economic uh, uh, consequences of research and the economic use of research and the uh, industrial bases in different countries are totally different. Okay, that is, that is something that we see. You, you may ask me, has divergence increased or decreased over the last decade? I would say it has increased. Everyone went up a little bit. But, it, but, but there was divergence and not convergence. Someone, at least if some pretend that they have invented indicators where there was some convergence, it was very, very small. Now, that being said, that our problem is a political problem to be solved at national level of strengthening and widening the social constituency for scientific development, which means that we have to, to address science teachers, that we have to address science communicators, that we have to address families, that we have to address everyone, that we have to address culture in society uh, to make uh, the, this connection, science, equal future to impress it on the minds of everyone, 
What is the international part of it? And I think this, and that is my last minute, is, comes from the fact that uh, never the international community was so, the, the scientific community was so internationalized as it is now. And in fact, we are one of the few sectors in society that can rely upon the generosity and the friendship of colleagues and people in other countries. And it would be uh, insane to deal with this problem at national level without the collaboration and the dialogue and the ideas and, and the support of people in other countries. I, uh, I understand that, um, uh, uh, and, I, and I would like to understand that you have invited me to come here because of that. I'm not from your country. I have been working in many European countries for many years. Uh, 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 it's an honor for me to come and to, uh, be, to share with you what is clearly, by the audience, what is clearly seen as a very critical national problem for, me, for Italy. But I would like to assure you that it is a very critical, but very different, everywhere, critical problem for everyone in other European countries. All of them have to do their job, but we must all share the pains and uh, the ideas that will make that job possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gago. It's a lively presentation, not only interesting, but also a very lively I think presentation. You're not the time you no. <laughs> <laughs>